as I was just listening to Annie um, share her testimony just now and thinking about our subject for tonight, good news about the judgment, I'm thinking that Annie probably is feeling pretty good about now as she thinks about meeting Jesus one day and not having to be afraid of what might happen. But I remember how that in one of the earlier presentations that you made, you made a reference to the fact that uh, uh, in our subculture anyway, there was a time where a cross-section of theologians and people felt like they had to do away with the whole idea of judgment in order to have assurance. And you said sort of in passing, as you mentioned that in the sermon that you were giving, that uh, if they'd understood things more clearly, they wouldn't needed to throw, they would not have needed to throw that out. I wonder if you'd um, maybe extract that thought a little more, uh, unpack it a little more for us. Well, it's based on the major premise that we've been talking about here. That is that our uh, Christianity and our salvation are not based upon what you do, but upon who you know. If that's true, then uh, I don't have to worry about the judgment because the judgment is not based on what I do. It's based on who I know. And if I know him, he goes to the judgment in my place. John 5, 24. So it becomes good news and we can maintain the judgment and not try to throw it out of the Bible. Wasn't there somebody uh, um, uh, from Australia, I think Jeffrey Paxton wrote a book in which he said that uh, Seventh-day Adventists anyway are pretty unclear on this and um, caused quite a stir or a shaking among us. Yes, and I was at a seminar <clears throat> with him and uh, a young preacher got up and said, Why, uh, what a relief, I can have security now because I uh, don't have to worry about the judgment. And I said to myself, uh, he doesn't understand. Because this, this shows that he is still a legalist in order to be insecure because of the judgment. He is focusing upon what you do. Behavior. Yeah, and this advertises the fact that uh, he's stuck on behavior. And if he understood the gospel and the judgment, he wouldn't have to be afraid. He could keep the judgment. Well, when I think of the judgment and fear, <clears throat> I know that there have been times in my life where it's been a fearful thing to think about. Have you always had the understanding you now have about the judgment, or was it ever different for you? Oh, no. I used to think that uh, the judgment was based upon uh, them getting out the heavenly adding machines and uh, <clears throat> adding up all of our good deeds and all of our bad deeds. And if we had 490 good deeds and uh, 480 bad deeds, oh good, we made it by 10. <laughs> I also figured that uh, they probably would go by alphabetical order, so I was glad for my name being down toward the end of the alphabet. <laughs> I really felt sorry for the Andersons and the Bakers. <laughs> <clears throat> that wasn't my train of thought. <clears throat> I understand you're going to give us a good defense for the good news of the judgment here tonight. And that's where you'll take up your thought okay, again. Okay, I'll take it up. <laughs> There's a story that I want to begin with. A couple of... Uh, I guess you'd call them bums. I don't know what you'd call them. They were people who didn't have a place to stay. And they slept wherever they could find a place. And they would eat whatever they could find to eat. And anyway, uh, in this one particular town, they had discovered that in a cemetery, which was surrounded by a large um, uh, shrub... Uh, hedge, <clears throat> dense hedge, they had discovered that uh, in this cemetery there was a huge tree full of walnuts and that it was bearing fruit and that if they were to go in there they could have a feast on walnuts to fill their empty stomachs and so they didn't want to go in during the day because they didn't want people to shoo them out so they had snuck in at night and it was just around midnight and they were in there uh, working on their walnuts. Well, there was a young man who had left his girlfriend's home rather late 
and he was walking for his home down the street and he happened to pass the cemetery and somehow passing a cemetery at midnight was a little bit unnerving to him. Um, but he was trying to brace himself and be a man, you know, and walk on by. And anyway, as he was walking by the cemetery, he heard two voices through the hedge. And this is what they were saying. One for you and one for me. <laughs> one for you and one for me. And his imagination went crazy and he thought this is God and the devil and they have come down and they're deciding the fate of all these people and I just happened to be hearing it. And it continued. He froze in fear. He stopped and he was listening through the hedge. One for you and one for me. One for you and one for me. And then without realizing that as they were sorting them out, one of them had dropped and rolled over his direction. You can imagine his terror when a voice said, and don't forget the one over there by the hedge. He took off. It was as if there had been a laying on of hands. <clears throat> Judgment. Is there good news? Is it possible to find good news in the subject of the judgment? Have you ever had to go before the judge? Oh, by the way, I saw a bumper sticker just recently that amused me. And I guess it was referring to what side of the judgment are you going to end up on? Because the bumper sticker said this, eternity, smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> With a question mark. But when I think about the judgment, I think about the kind of experiences that I have had in human courts with human judges. Uh, there was a time where I was racing to get to a uh, preaching appointment that I had in Colorado. And I passed somebody who was going just way too slow. And I happened to pass them right when an officer was using a radar gun. And, and um, he stopped me and gave me a ticket. But it was a small town. And it was one of these circuit judges that came through once a month. And so I went back a month later to meet the judge and to uh, try to appeal. Because I knew I had been speeding. That wasn't something I was going to contest. But the officer had written me up for 10 miles an hour over what I knew I was going. And the reason I knew what I was going was because I had been behind that car, see? And I was looking at how slow they were going, and I was watching how slow I was going. I had my eyes riveted on that speedometer, and so I knew what I was doing. And then I just went around him. And I looked down as I went around him to see how much faster I'd gotten to get past him. And then I looked up and saw the radar gun and the... And I think you call them Holsteins, the black and white cars. And um, so I was going to contest the speed. I was going to say guilty. So I, I was there. And because I was a V, I had to wait, Venden, till the end. I'll never forget the judge as he came in that night. They said, all rise for his honor, whatever, whatever, whatever. And everybody stood and he said, be seated. And we sat down. And then he said this. He said, um... I just want to set something straight right now as we begin. He said, we are not here tonight to decide whether you're guilty or not. He said, that's between you and God. He said, we're here tonight to find out how much you're going to pay. And I guess he was referring to the countless times people would get up and say, I'm not guilty, Your Honor. And, you know, and finally came my turn. I was the last one left, the very last. Nobody else in the courtroom. I walked up to the judge. He said, how do you plead? And I said, I plead guilty with an explanation, Your Honor. And he said, what kind of a plea is that? I said, well, I'm not guilty of speeding the speed that he said I was speeding, but I'm guilty of speeding. I want to give an explanation because it's not accurate what he wrote me down for. He looked at me for a moment and he said, okay, what's your explanation? 
I said, my explanation is that I was going 10 over, not 20 over. And he wrote me up for 20 over. He was using a radar gun. He looked over at the bailiff and he rolled his eyes and he said, radar gun. He said, I have seen them clock trees at 60 miles an hour with radar guns. <laughs> this was a, not a real encouraging thing to me. <laughs> he looked back at me and he says, well, we have a problem because you either have to plead guilty or not guilty. It's not a middle of the road thing. Either you're guilty or you're not guilty. And I said, but I am not guilty of what he said I was. And yet I am guilty. <laughs> he looked at his watch and he said this to me. I'll never forget it. He said, you know what? I wanted to see Starsky and Hutch tonight. <laughs> and if I have to keep hassling with you, I'm going to miss the program. He said, I'll tell you what. Would you be willing to plead guilty to driving with a defective headlight? This was before Clinton and OJ. <laughs> I said, what? He said, it's very simple. He says, if you plead guilty of driving with a defective headlight, it's not going to go on your record. It won't affect your insurance. The fine is $10. We can call this thing. It's over. You don't have to call any kind of a jury trial or anything else. I can watch Starsky and Hutch. You can go home. Nothing short of $10 is all you'll lose on the deal. So tell me, would you be willing to plead guilty to driving with a defective headlight? I said, you know, uh, Your Honor, now that you mention it, I do remember my lights weren't working that day. <laughs> he said, $10, please judgment. How much are you going to pay? As we look at the judgment tonight, I want us to note how Jesus plans to take care of his friends at that time. How Jesus plans to take care of his friends at that time. We'll take a little look also at how much we're going to pay before we're done. But as we start, I want to ask this question. I pose this question for the beginning. What does the Bible teach about the reality of a final judgment? What does it teach? Now, there are many, many texts that I could give you, but I'm just going to rifle through uh, four of them quickly. The first one is in Psalms 9, verses 7 through 8. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. Okay, and Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 32. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him... He will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. We could go on with many more scriptures, but we're just going to refer to those four as a sample of what the Bible has to say about a final judgment. There is indeed going to be a final judgment. It's biblical. Question number two, who is the judge? Who is the judge? Again, we're gonna look at scripture. And again, I'm just gonna be taking a sampling from a large number of scriptures we could choose from, okay? Just a sampling. First one, John 5, 22. For the Father judges, how many people? No one, but has committed all judgment to the who? To the Son, capital S. You notice we got the capital in the right place. <clears throat> 
John 5, 26 and 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And has given him, who? The Son. Authority to execute what? Judgment also. Another one from Romans, chapter 2 and verse 16. God will judge the secrets of men by whom? Jesus Christ. And one more, Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. We shall stand before the judgment seat of who? Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Okay, we learned two things here. We learned that we're going to be judged by God, but which of the Godhead is the judge? Jesus. And he is every bit as much God as the Father and as the Holy Spirit. All right. So the Bible teaches there is a judgment. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the judge. Who is the prosecuting attorney? Who is the one who accuses? <clears throat> Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Now you probably already figure who the accuser of the brethren is, but just make sure there's no confusion among us. If you happen to have a Bible that has a marginal reference or some kind of a cross-linking uh, referencing system, uh, most Bibles will have in the margin for Revelation 12.10 a reference pointing to Zechariah 3.1 beside the word accuser, accuser of the brethren. We're going to look at Zechariah 3.1 next. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, got the lowercase in the right place, <laughs> and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And if your Bible had marginal referencing, you would look there in the margin and you discover that it's pointing you right back to Revelation 12.10 which is the translator's way of letting us know that the accuser of the brethren is also the very same as Satan or the devil. One more scripture, Job 1, verses 7 through 10. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? So who is the prosecuting attorney? Satan. So there is a judgment. Jesus is the judge. Satan is the prosecuting attorney. Now, I want you to try and follow closely with me because what's going to happen in the next few minutes may be surprising to you. My next question is, what does the judgment appear to be based upon. What does the judgment appear to be based upon? Again, we're going to look at a smattering of Scripture, a sampling of Scripture. And we're going to start with Matthew 25, verses 34 to 36. This is a little bit longer Scripture, but I'm going to read it. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. This is what he says to the people that he lets in. In this passage, which is referring to entrance into heaven, final judgment. How is it decided who gets in? My question was, what does it appear that the judgment is based upon? Next scripture, Matthew 25, just a little further down. 
Verses 41 to 43, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. So he said to the one group, you can come in. You did the right stuff. He said to the other group, you can't come in. You did the wrong stuff. Is it any wonder then that many people have concluded that the way you get to heaven is by being good to the disadvantaged people and to the underdogs? The more underdogs you help, the more sure your ticket in. That's what it appears to be saying in Matthew 25. Another scripture, Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I am coming quickly. This is Jesus speaking. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his what? In, to his works. I'm coming. My reward is going to be based according to your work. That's from the Bible. And one more, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. So what does it appear that the basis for judgment is here? How good or bad you are. Whether you've done the good stuff, or you've done the bad stuff, whether you've looked out for the underdog, whether you haven't. That's what it appears. But this poses a big problem. Because Jesus himself said something in John 17, 3, and I'm not ready for that scripture yet. I want to set it up just briefly. Many years ago, I was watching a television commercial, and um, maybe you remember seeing this commercial. It was probably downtown New York, and there were buses and taxis and people and commotion and cars and traffic and lights and noise and you know hundreds of people in this in this commercial. Two men are walking across a crosswalk, surrounded by a whole slew of other people. And um, the commercial has the two of them talking to each other. And one of them is saying to the other one, what do you think about this particular investment? And the other one replies, well, my broker, E.F. Hutton, says. And at that moment, every person within camera view freezes, whether it's a bus or a taxi or a driver or someone else in the crosswalk or people on the side or other people in cars. Everybody freezes and cocks an ear in the direction of these two men. And then the narrator's voice says, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Now, John 17, 3. If you have a Bible that is a red letter edition, the words are going to be in red. Which means what? Jesus is speaking here. Do you think it would be safe to assume that Jesus is the E.F. Hutton on eternal life? So if Jesus has something to say about eternal life, it would be good for us to cock our ear and listen, right? Here's the E.F. Hutton on eternal life. And what does he say? This is life eternal, that they do all of the good stuff and help the poor and don't do anything bad. Is that what he said? Is that what the E.F. Hutton on eternal life said? No, look at it again. No, now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We've said it before and yet right now it looks like we're at a dilemma because how can you have eternal life based on who you know and at the same time, have it based on what you do. 
C.S. Lewis, describing a problem similar to this, said this. He said, you cannot have it both ways and no sneers at the limitations of logic. Amend the dilemma, he said. Fix it. How can you have it both ways? Why is it that the Bible seems to say that it's based on my behavior, my works, my performance, my deeds? And yet Jesus also in the same book seems to say it's, it's about who you know. It's not about what you do. Amen the dilemma. Can you have it both ways? What if I told you you cannot swim without getting wet? Is that true? Well, on first thought, maybe. But I have a friend back in Auburn named John who scuba dives every chance he gets. He probably goes scuba diving in the Puget Sound 130 times a year. And he's never gotten wet while doing it. Do you know why? John uses a thing that's called a dry suit. He gets into his suit just the way he's dressed. Blue jeans, t-shirt, whatever. He gets into this suit. It comes on down. There's gloves that go in. Everything is one piece. It zips up. It has a seal around his neck. It has a hood that comes down over. And he can go 150 feet under the water in the Puget Sound and dive for as long as he wants. Come back out. And he's perfectly dry. He went swimming. But he never got wet. Somehow he was able to amend the dilemma. It seems as though you couldn't go swimming without getting wet, but John does it regularly. Is there a way for us to understand the apparent conflict between works and faith when it comes to judgment? Well, let's tackle it. What do our actions say about God? What do our actions say about God? Isaiah 60 verse 21 is the first scripture I'm going to look through here with you. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands that I may be glorified. Let's try and paraphrase that. God's saying through the prophet, my people will be righteous because of the work that I'm doing in them, because of the work of my hands. And the result is going to be that I'm going to be glorified by what is seen in them. Next scripture, Matthew 5, verse 16. Jesus speaking again. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. That does not make any sense on the surface. Why would people glorify the Father in heaven for my good works? See? See? Let your light so shine that people will see your good works. Jesus is talking about works here. He's talking about good works. This language is very similar to the language we looked at at the very beginning, isn't it? But he says, I want you to live your life in such a way that when people see your good works, they give the credit to God. How would you possibly give credit to God for my good works? See, if it was my good works, you'd come to me and you'd say, Lee, you really did a good job. We're really proud of you. We just really like how you did that. You have it figured out. You do good work. Lee, you fixed it. You did it good for you. But if they're not saying that, if they're saying, wow, you have an awesome God, then something must be going at cross purposes here, they must not be thinking that my good works could have possibly been produced by me. Or they never would have given credit to God for it. Right? 
John 15, 8. Jesus said, by this, and uh, by the way, in John 15, it's all about fruit bearing. Remember? I'm the vine, you're the branches. All about fruit bearing. And Jesus is saying in John 15, 8, by this, by your fruit bearing, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Once again, somehow my behavior, my works, my deeds are somehow causing God to be glorified. Once again, impossible if I'm the one responsible for it. If I'm the one responsible for it, I'm the one who gets the credit too. I like to sing the song, glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. <laughs> then I put that little PS, you know, when by his grace I can look on his face, that will be glory for me. <laughs> Give me a break. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory for thee, not me. Good fruit is a reflection on the gardener, not on the plant. The gardener, not the vines or branches, is responsible for the health of the garden. Oh, this gets really good. Good fruit is required. It's not optional. And in fact, the judgment includes an analysis of the fruit. And it sounds at first like it's based on my good works. But the Bible is saying over and over and over again that I am incapable of producing good works. So if there is any good work seen in me, then it would have to have been the result of the gardener and not of me. That is good news. If you've never been to Bouchard Gardens, you're going to get a five slide tour of Bouchard Gardens right now. I want you to see some shots here of the flowers at Bouchard Gardens. You can walk through those paths, you can see what they've done there. They took an old quarry and they completely rent through it and they planted flowers. And during the year, the various seasons, the uh, patterns and the colors and the plants vary, but they're always beautiful. It doesn't matter what time of year you go to Bouchard Gardens, it's always beautiful. And those flowers are grouped in such wonderful arrangements. The colors are so complementary. The division of color and the patterns and the picturesque uh, way in which the garden is laid out, it's just a wonder. And people come from all over the world to see Bouchard Gardens. But I can tell you something. At Bouchard Gardens, you can buy in their shop, you can buy seeds of the plants that are on display. You can buy the seeds and take them home. But I've never heard anybody at Bouchard Gardens talk like this. <coughs> My, can you believe the kind of plants that they grow in Canada? These are the most amazing plants. They group themselves in such awesome arrangements. You throw the seed out there and those plants, they just seem to have some kind of sixth sense and they zoom all the yellow ones go over here and all the blue ones go over here and all the red ones go over here and then they line up along the sidewalks and they do this and they do that. These are amazing plants. I'm going to go buy some of those seeds. Man, I can't wait. Take a bunch of those seeds and throw them in my backyard and watch what happens. People don't talk that way at Bouchard Gardens. What I hear people say, and I've been there many times, I overlisten, I overhear the conversations, and this is what people are saying. I wonder how many gardeners they have working here. I wonder how many employees this place keeps. I wonder what the master gardener is thinking when he works with this oriental garden that's over here. Or when he works over here in the bottom of the quarry next to the fountain. I wonder who is responsible for the master plan for year by year, annual, what's coming up here and what's coming up there in December or, or March. People ask those kind of questions. They don't marvel at the seeds. They marvel at the gardeners. We do not praise the flowers for arranging themselves so attractively. When we look at Bouchard Gardens, we conclude that someone cares for the garden and it shows. 
That's what we conclude. What sort of care and responsibility does Jesus take for his friends? Here's a scripture that we've used over and over, and it's one of my favorites, Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Approval. He started it. He'll finish it. It's his work. He's the gardener. Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by who? By you? By me? No. The fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ. He's responsible for them. And it continues, to the glory and praise of God. There it is again. People giving praise and credit to God for the good works they see. Why? Because they're convinced that the person could never have done it. And so they're convinced that God had to have done it. We cannot produce obedience, but God promises to take care of that for those who will remain in connection with the vine. Over and over again in John 15, he tells us to abide. The command is abide. The command is not to bear fruit. The command is to abide. And bearing fruit is the natural result of abiding. In other words, you don't say, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and control your temper. That's not how it works. Oh, there are people who teach that. There are cathedrals that go on television and tell us that that's what it is. Possibility thinking. You can do whatever you put your mind to do. It's all within you. You can be your own savior if you just try hard enough and envision yourself. You shoot for the goal. You smash in the target. You work at it. You grit your teeth. You can do it. Seeds do not produce by trying to produce. A gardener takes care of them, gives them water, pulls the weeds, gives them nutrition. John 15 makes it clear that fruit is the natural result of continuing to maintain a friendship with Jesus. And since that is true, then our actions reveal whether or not we know Jesus. There we're getting to the heart of the matter. See, ultimately, when you get into heaven, it's going to be what E.F. Hutton on heaven and eternal life said it was. He said, this is how you get in, by knowing the right people. And he's trying to help us understand that if you know the right people, they produce the right fruit in you. They do it. And there's no way you'd have the right fruit if they didn't do it. So if you have the right fruit, it's not because you got it together. It's because you stayed with the vine and he reproduced himself in you. That's how it works. Since that is true, our actions, our actions reveal whether or not we know Jesus. This is, this is an amazing thought. It came to me out of the clear blue. Obedience is so important to God. Is the law important? Is obedience important? Is a Christ-like character important? There are people who say that when you talk about righteousness by faith that you are just throwing out the need for obedience and character development and all those things. They don't matter. You know, you're just tossing it all away saying, relationship, relationship. Obedience doesn't matter. My friends, let me tell you something. Obedience matters so much to God that he won't even trust us with it. He does it himself in us. That's how important it is. He says, this is too important to let you do it. You'd mess up. I'll do it for you and through you. In fact, that's what I did for my son. Jesus himself said it. He said, if you can't believe that I am the son of God and that my father is the Messiah because of what I say, I'll tell you what. Believe me because of the works that I do because I'll tell you what. I don't do the works. The father, he does the works in the son. God didn't even trust Jesus with doing the works. He did it through his son. And Jesus came to show us how to depend upon someone bigger than ourselves in order for us to produce the works. If we depend upon him, he produces the works. So if you're in relationship with Jesus, what is your standing with God? Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no what? Condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the three judgment stories that Jesus used... What do those who are kept out, what do the losers have in common? In Matthew 7, they say, Lord, Lord, we did many wonderful things. And he will say to them plainly, I never knew you. 
Away from me, you evildoers. That gives you an interesting perspective. God considers it evil, even if I've done good, if I don't know him. Another one, Matthew 25, 1 to 12, 10 bridesmaids, all looking for the return of the bridegroom. They were all Adventists. <laughs> all 10 of them. And five of them were ready to go and five of them weren't. And what was the reason that the five who didn't get in were, what were they told? Why were they not allowed in? Later, when the other five bridesmaids, the other five Adventists returned, they stood outside calling, sir, open the door for us. But he called back, I don't know you. Getting in here is about knowing the right people. We don't know each other. There was never any communion, never any relationship. You were so busy trying to live a good life that you had no time for me. And this is what heaven's all about. It's about me hanging out with my friends and having learned that relationship before I even got here so that heaven begins now. Finally, Luke 13, once again, shut door. And what do they say? They say, we ate and drank with you. We taught, you taught in our streets. And they go on with a further, further list. You know, we, we fed the hungry and we took care of the widow and we visited those in prison. Lord, let us in. Sounds like good stuff. He gives them the same answer. He says, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evil doers. He calls good works done outside of a personal relationship with him evil. That's what he calls it. It's not my words. Those are his words. For too long, we have thought that it was all about our deeds instead of all about our relationship. And we have beaten ourselves and our children for four generations, five generations to where they don't even want to have anything to do with Christianity because they just got too bruised and beaten trying to do it themselves. At the judgment, what happens to those who have a relationship with Christ? I used to have nightmares. I used to imagine that Satan was going to unroll a list when they called Lee Vanden. And Satan comes out with a scroll. And he undoes the scroll. He has to have half a dozen imps help him carry it out. He's been making a list and checking it twice. He's the one who makes the list and checks it twice. <laughs> Happens to have the same letters of the name of the Christmas fellow. But anyway. <clears throat> Lee Vanden. And they untie the scroll and Satan lets it go and it rolls out for about 100 miles down the middle aisle and everybody's going, whoa, I didn't know he was that bad. As they look over and see the things written. That was the nightmare I used to have. That's why I was glad that dad gave me the last name Venden so that I could have looked at yours first. I said that at a camp meeting one time and a guy stood up in the back and he said, the Bible says the first will be last and the last will be first. <laughs> I think I heard an Anderson say amen. But the good news, as dad already said in an earlier sermon, is that when they call my name, Jesus steps to the front and he says, I told him he didn't have to be here for this. He's a friend of mine. And God, the father looks down. He says, hey, any friend of yours is a friend of mine. He's welcome here. And we know this is true because we have it in God's word. John 5, 24. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, which unpacks all of the possible nuances of interpretation. This is what it says. I assure you most solemnly, I tell you. And this is Jesus speaking. The person whose ears are open to my words, who listens to my message, and who believes and trusts in and clings to and relies on him who sent me has, H-A-S, has, possesses now eternal life, and does not come up for judgment. Does not incur sense of judgment, will not come under condemnation, but has already passed over out of death into life. Amen. Romans 8, 31 then, if God is for us, who can be against us? You can face judgment confidently because the judge is your friend. The good news is this, that if you know Jesus, one, he promises to take care of the changes needed in your life. He will make himself responsible for the fruit. Two, he assures you that you are not condemned. And three, he sees to it that you don't even come up for judgment. If that's not good news... I don't know what is. I asked my dad to read a parable as we close about a criminal named Tom.
Tom was a criminal, a really bad one. Not just your ordinary, everyday, small town crook, he was big time. He was a cheat, a liar, a robber, a gambler, an adulterer, and murderer. He would sell his own mother if he thought it would get him what he wanted. He prided himself on having no scruples, on having done everything there was to do, but he had been caught. Now he sat in prison trying to figure out what his next move would be. He thought desperately of escape. He thought of suicide. Neither was possible. He was too closely guarded. He practiced all sorts of speeches, denying his illegal activities, but none of them sounded convincing even to him. He was in big trouble, and Tom knew it. The longer he sat there forced to think, the more despondent he became. The whole future looked black. It seemed that things couldn't possibly be worse. He was really at the end of his rope. Then one day, a prison official came to Tom's cell and said, Tom, we have some good news for you and some bad news. Tom looked up sullenly. Yet deep inside, he felt eager for any change in the misery of just sitting there day after day. He braced himself for the worst. The good news is that a lawyer has been assigned to your case, and he is the best lawyer in the whole world. Tom was silent. He knew there was a catch somewhere, and sure enough, there was. The official continued. The bad news is that the prosecuting attorney has also been assigned, and he is the best prosecuting attorney in the whole world. Tom remained silent. The prison official shook his head. That lawyer must be crazy to think of defending you. But anyway, he'll be in to see you tomorrow. And he turned and walked away. The next day, a quiet sort of gentleman came to Tom's cell and knocked. Tom looked up startled and then laughed bitterly. You've got the key, man, he said. Why knock? I only go where I'm invited, replied the visitor. <clears throat> well, come on in, Tom said. I wasn't going anywhere. The visitor opened the door, entered, and sat down. So who are you anyway, Tom asked. I'm a lawyer. I understand you're looking for a lawyer to take your case. Yes, said Tom. It's about time they finally sent me someone. But tell me about your qualifications. I hear you're supposed to be good. Well, said the lawyer, I have some good news for you and some bad news. The good news is that I have never lost a case. If you place yourself in my hands, I can guarantee the outcome of the trial. And the bad news is the price, right, said Tom. The lawyer nodded. Okay, lay it on me. How much is it going to cost? It's free. I beg your pardon? It's free, the lawyer repeated. Hey, I'm not a rich man, but if I don't, I don't need your charity, said Tom. If I can just get out of this dump, I can raise the money. The lawyer smiled kindly. No, if you want my help, you must accept it as a gift. You cannot pay me for any part of it. It is totally and completely free. It's one of the conditions for my taking your case. Tom was silent for a few minutes and then asked, Are there other conditions for receiving your help? Well, the lawyer replied, I have some more good news and bad news for you. The good news is that all you have to do if you want me to take your case is just ask me and I'll take it immediately. The bad news is that if I take your case, you'll have to plead guilty. Tom gasped. Aren't you guilty, asked the lawyer. Um, yes, but if I plead guilty to all the charges made against me, I won't have a ghost of a chance. They'll throw the book at me. How can you possibly think you'll be able to help me if I plead guilty? I have some bad news for you and some good news, said the lawyer. The bad news is that if you plead guilty, of course you'll be convicted. And if you don't plead guilty, the prosecuting attorney has sufficient proof that you'll be convicted anyway. Either way, there's no doubt but that you'll get the death sentence. Then why even have a trial, said Tom. You forgot that I have some good news, said the lawyer. I am willing to take your sentence and let you go free. No way, cried Tom. You aren't the one who has lived a rotten life. I'm the one. I've done nothing good. I don't deserve anything but death. Hanging is too good for me. There is no way I can let you pay for my crimes. The lawyer replied gently, but Tom, I already have paid. If you will accept my substitution in your behalf, it's yours. A turmoil of thoughts whirled in Tom's brain. At last he spoke. I'm interested, but are there any other conditions? Yes, said the lawyer with a smile. You and I must become friends and spend time together. As our friendship grows, you'll become more like me and less like a criminal. I'm not so sure about that, said Tom. The prospect of pardon looks good, but what if I want to go my own way? Can't we just arrange it so I can be released from the penalty of my actions? Isn't that enough? Do I really have to stop being a crook? The pardon is only good for those who are willing for me to give them a new life, said the lawyer. 
Tom stared at the floor while the lawyer waited patiently for his decision. At last, Tom raised his head. I would like to ask you to take my case, he said. I admit that I'm guilty, and I really don't want to keep on being a crook. I accept your help, and I want to become one of your friends. The lawyer rose and held out his hand. Tom took it firmly, and the contract was sealed. Is there anything else I should know before you leave? One final thing, said the lawyer. I have one last bit of good news and bad news for you. Tom smiled. Give me the bad news first and get it over with, although all of a sudden it doesn't seem as though any of your bad news has been that bad. The lawyer smiled too. All right. The bad news is that we have set the date for your trial. Why, that's not bad news at all, exclaimed Tom. With a lawyer like you, do you think I would want to stay here in this place forever and never even have my case go to court? The news of the coming judgment is terrific news. And your good news better be pretty good to outdo that. The lawyer looked into Tom's eyes for a moment before he said gently, The good news is this. When you come to trial, I will not only be your lawyer, I will be your judge as well. Great is thy faithful.
for sin and a peace that endureth. We thank you for that tonight. We're thankful for your faithfulness to us. Please help us to be faithful to you. And thank you that you are our attorney and our judge, dear Lord. We pray in your name. Amen.